Colin, this is fantastic to have you here. Fantastic I go, for me. Uh, thank you so much for coming out here because I go back to 1976 yeah. when I came out to California to play. And when I came out here, I had been studying with Joe Morello. Yeah. And Morello said to me, you have got to track down Colin. He's a fantastic player. He's a great person. And you'll learn a lot from him, especially his foot technique. Yeah. And that intrigued me when he specifically said his foot technique because <laughs> when I heard recordings of you playing, your musicality, your drive playing jazz, small group playing was so exciting and so intense, every note you played, that for Joe to kind of narrow it down to saying he's a great musician, but check out his foot. Yeah, yeah. When well, I started, and you did. And I did, and well, I came right out here. Right on the floor. <laughs> I, I came to your place to take lessons, and I would yeah. remove the floor, Tom, and lay on the floor and watch your foot and learn. You have got so much that you have done in your career. And if it started out in the UK where you were, you were born? Yeah, I was, I was born in a village outside of a small town in the West Country. <laughs> really? And when did music come into your life? When did... I was four, apparently. Uh, I used to stop in the chair as my parents said, this boy's gonna be a drummer. <laughs> and they encouraged me all the way. But when I was seven, I got my first real drum set. But I was playing in like silly bands, you know, like the Nibs. Two accordions, banjo and drums. Two accordions? Banjo and drums. Can you imagine what that <laughs> sounded like? Oh, God. Whoa, one accordion would be it, bad enough, too. It probably would be pretty hip now to hear that. <laughs> I could put it out on, you know, sell it. You know? <laughs> Comedy. And you played for a while with that band? Yeah, and I played with another band when I was 10 called the Firecrackers, which was the, uh, uh, during the war they had the uh, fire service. You know, yeah. my dad was in it. So uh, it was some guys from that band. Like trumpet, violin, a lot of it was just ridiculous, you know, but it was all playing. As I played all through. And so you, were, you, you were play, it was, and the music was all different types of music, so you were yeah. learning different styles yeah, as you were yeah, playing? Yeah. I started playing, there was a big band in Swindon, my hometown. I played on Saturday nights for, a, for quite a while. And then uh, I went on the road when I was, I left school at 15, because you couldn't, it was the 1949. And uh, a few weeks later, I went on the road with a big band on the bus, one-nighters, but I couldn't take it, it was too tough. <laughs> I only lasted a few weeks. But then, uh, when I was 18, I got the call to play with Winifred Atwell, who was a star, you know, classical I mean, commercial pianist. And I went all over the place with her, Australia, New Zealand, and... So, and you were how old at, the, at that time? Uh, when I went with her, I was 18. 18, and you're traveling the world. Yeah. What kind of music was it? Well, it was like, Boogie Woogie and, uh, you know, Latin, boom, kick, 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 it was pretty corny stuff. Yeah, yeah. It was a name job, you know, it got me out of work, I was doing some studio work in London. And uh, then we went to Australia, the New Zealand was tour, 1955, we'd gone for over a year. And we got back to England, couldn't stand the weather, so we emigrated to Australia. <laughs> <laughs> How long were you in Australia for? Uh, two and a half years. From Australia, that took you to LA? To San Francisco first, because the Kingston Trio, remember the Kingston Trio? The group yeah. I was with, the Australian Jazz Quartet, we were their opening group act, you know. So they liked us, and uh, we got on great together, liked our music, so they invited us to come to the States to do a six weekend tour <laughs> with them, pay all our wages, airfares, hotel, everything. So, you know, we got a green card, man. <laughs> I didn't think I was going to be able to stay, but you know, I'd only been here maybe seven weeks, and Vince Guaraldi called me to play with him and Monty Budwick. Now, who was Vince Guaraldi? Vince Guaraldi was the guy who did the uh, Peanuts music, Charlie Brown. All the, so he wrote all, 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 all that music there. So he was a very important Oh, man, Vince, Vince I mean, those are world-class players. Yeah. You know? I couldn't believe that I was going to get to play with those guys on a permanent basis, you know. So how long were you in L.A. before you had met these guys? I wasn't in L.A. at all. I went to San Francisco. So you, because that's where Bayer. the Kingston Trio lived. And that's where Their they lived. manager okay. was there, so we right, went right. there first. So you were there, so how long were you in San Fran in that area? Oh, boy, how long was I there? Not that long, really, but uh, when Victor called me, I had to come down here, you know. So that's when you made the move to come down yeah, yeah. to L.A.? Yeah. Victor Feldman had given you a call. Yeah. And, and what, was his, what was that call about? What was that first? He first says, uh, well, I'd like to he heard me on this Jazz Impressions of Black Orpheus record with Vince. Like my playing, so we like to come down and play in, in my trio. You know. so, yeah, da, da, da. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. I'm playing with a trio every night, boy. Thrills. The uh, freedom that you have, the yeah. space that you have. It was so hot, man. Yeah. Victory swinging, you know. But uh, yeah, that was some great times in those days. <laughs> well, Victor was was a, not only a great. 
piano player. He's a great percussionist. Vibes player. He was a good vibes His player. Vibes yeah, playing was yeah. fantastic. He did a lot of work with Philly Dan. Philly Dan, yeah, yeah. So he was doing tons of session work. Yeah. He had his own group, which you were in yeah. at that time. So you come out here, so you're, you're working, in, 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 and now you're in L.A. You're playing. Your name got around because, I mean, the call started coming in. Oh, yeah, it did. I mean, I, I was playing with all kinds of people, like Barney Kessel, <laughs> and doing sessions, like jingles mostly, you know. Yeah. And uh, then yeah, I was telling you about the book, how I got to do bass drum control. The guys were coming in to hear me. I, I just got into this bass drum technique about a year before I moved here. Yeah. And uh, I was practicing five hours a day, you know, with this. So, uh, they were coming in and going back to the drum shop, Bob Yeager Pro Drum. I said, man, you're this new kid in town, man, his foot. So Yeager <laughs> said, why don't you write a book of exercises? <laughs> that's and right. that's bass drum control, still out there. You know? Bob Yeager was a special oh, person from he, the professional he, drum shop. He organized my, te my career. Mm. 63, he said, you're going to go with Camco. Nick Ceroli and me were the first two endorsements for Camco. Yeah. And then when I went with George Shearing in 1966, he said, now you're going to go with Ludwig. He had like a lot of say in what was going on in, yeah. in the drum business, you know. Well, he was the guy out here oh, when it yeah, came to the yeah. professional drum shop. Yeah, he was a guy, but Bob also was a very special guy. Oh, one intense he didn't, he guy. He didn't take, take anything, you know. Uh, he he was, told someone to get the out of his he shop. He was and, New York style. There was a guy who was walking through, you know, walking through the song. Uh, Bob says, "Hey, man, get that out of my shop." <laughs> He was a, a, a tough guy, but but he opened up you know the, the direction of your career. So he allowed yeah, you to he, did. he guided you along to go to certain companies. Yeah, and then he got when Pearl came out in '72, he got me with them too. Right. So you know, and then '79 when D.W. started, I was Nick Thrilly and me were the first endorsee for D.W. Interesting. 1979. I got, Interesting. My, I got my first drum set from them in 1980. The strangest. Yeah. It was like 20 by 16 bass drum. Large, small town, and a 14 by 14 floor. You know. <laughs> it's like, it was great, it was great. It lasted me a long time. You know. They make fantastic product, absolutely. Well, they do, yeah. Absolutely. So, so here you are, you're, you're, you're in LA at this time. People are calling you up. The different jobs that you had, because I remember Morello talking about you with George Shearing. Yeah, yeah. And he just said how they loved your playing and how you played with George Shearing, which was amazing. And then Joe Pass, and there were so many oh, Joe, yeah, artists yeah. that you started hooking up yeah, with. Yeah, yeah. What's amazing is that you were totally prepared yeah. from the hard work that you put into the years yeah, of practicing, yeah, yeah. that when these calls came in, you knew how to deliver. Yeah, yeah. well, you had, to be, you had to be able to do it, otherwise you wouldn't get the, the job. But, you know, play, playing with Joe Pass, I was like, <sighs> George Shearing was great, but it wasn't swinging, you know I mean? It was, Great music. Yeah. Uh, one night, Joe Pass did, did a solo, you know, Stella by Starlight, and all of a sudden, it's like swinging. Yeah. George had stopped comping. <laughs> <laughs> His comping was like, chuk, chuk, rook, rook, chuk, you know, like, you know, like stiff. <laughs> so he stopped playing. It was like, hey, you know, freedom. But uh, playing with Joe, I, I did 14 albums with him through the years. Yeah. Twelve and then two that we released from Japan, stuff he didn't want to release. <laughs> Who was on bass at that time? Who was working with Jim you? Hewart. Okay. He's the guy in the trio I have on my bass drum DVD. Uh, I play with him a lot, him and John Chiodini, the same guitar player. That is fantastic. Yeah. So we play in this little club out in Ventura where I live uh, uh, called Squashed Grapes. <laughs> These people own a small winery and it's a jazz wine bar, you know. So we have a good time playing it, you know, it's nice. 20 minutes from my house. How uh, ideal is that? Yeah, it's great, yeah. There's a drum shop right opposite where I do a little teaching, you know. <laughs> now, 1964 is when you wrote the book. Yeah. And what's amazing about the book, Alan, is I had seen the book, and when I saw the book, studying with Morello, then coming out here and seeing the book, I, I was like blown away by how clear the exercises were, yeah, yeah. how great the book was laid out, yeah. and it was just so incredible to, to learn from that. And even though, at the time I learned it as a single bass drum player, I then went back and applied it yeah, to double bass. Yeah, I know you did, you were, you were fantastic. <laughs> it was, but it was great to learn because it really kind of gave me, it, it, it was the first book that I ever studied that was strictly about my feet. Yeah, you know, I still practice that uh, every day, that book. Yeah. It's hard, man. I go down the page, you know, I just don't <laughs> do singles. I go right down, it's hard. <laughs> it really is, you know. <laughs> I know Some I know days well. I can't uh, make it, you know. But, uh, most time I did. So then a DVD was put together with the book? Yeah. Where you play the book? Yeah. And well, uh, the DVD was a Don Lombardi's idea, DW. Through Drum Channel, in the, yeah. And they have a beautiful studio there. Yeah. And uh, no baffles. We just like, we're like in the club. Greatest recording, you know. Yeah. I don't know how they did it, but uh, 
That was wonderful to do that. You know. And it, it, it's one of the few books that you wrote. So you kind of got involved in education. Were you doing any teaching at the time? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, I've done three books. My second book called uh, Jazz Solos, The Art of Phrasing. Right. It's a great book. You know? Yeah. If, if anyone who wants to get into jazz, you know, I did, I did a CD with it with a wonderful guitar player named Bruce Foreman, I'm a bass player from San Francisco, and uh, we did five tunes with me, me on, and then five tunes with a click track with no drums. Right. And, you know, it's funny, on, on the internet, well, not internet, on the Facebook, some guy did it on a concert, uh, the slow one, but it was called Blue, Blue, Blue's Elizer. And you hear my voice say, one, two, one, and I played along with it, you know, so I couldn't believe it. I kind of lost track of who it was. I wanted to say thank you. you know. I couldn't believe it, you know. That's it's from stunning. Brazil. You know. But that, I, I never forget, in 76 when I was out here, 77 around there, you had invited me to a session that you had done, The Artful Dodger, with yeah. Victor Feldman. Yeah. I couldn't make it because I was working out here. But when I heard that recording, that really blew me away. Yeah on how great you played, your time, your musicality. Well, the you. arrangements too, agitation. Oh, Victor. He wrote hard they, stuff. They were, they were they're that, very uh, difficult. That agitation. I mean, you know, like reading it's, that. It's agitation. Yeah, yeah that, that, well, that, that was the Artful Dodger. Well, that was the Artful Dodger. <laughs> the other one was just as hard, you know. Yeah. And he wanted it to be really on top. So it kind of rushed a bit, really. Yeah. But he wanted to like, yeah, you know. That's what I'm talking about. So you had to adapt. So each different player had different requirements. Oh, yeah. You had to adapt for what they wanted. Yeah. Well, they usually hired me for what I did, you know, about my, for my playing. They yeah. didn't know if I would suit them or not, you know. I mean, Joe Pass, I, I worked with him. He, he was in Synanon, you know, which is like for recovering yeah. alcohol. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I was on the first album he did with Claire Fisher. It was called... Uh, Catch Me, which Joe hated. The, the, it was the name of a, a, a tune with something else, but Dick Bach, the producer, said he wanted to have it Catch Me. Joe goes, oh man. You know. <laughs> but uh, we did that, and I did, I did Joe's most famous album for Django in 1964 again. Yeah. And uh, it was not a great time, you know, playing. And, and Joe Pass, what, 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 just explain to the audience, because these names that you're mentioning, someone like Victor Feldman or Joe Pass, yeah. Barney Kessel, yeah. who I had the fortunate opportunity of playing with Barney, yeah, well, Barney some years later on. Beautiful, beautiful player. Remember what he does? So, again, small group trio. Yeah. What would, these names are important because it's it's the research that should be done by this next generation yeah. is to go by now with the advent of the internet and to research these names yeah. and get to know some of their music. Powerful stuff. Joe Pass. Tell, tell me about Joe Pass. I mean, what, what made his his he way of playing totally was crazy. so unique? Yeah. Well, he just. He was playing like that when he was, you know, shooting up in Vegas and that. You know, he was still playing, playing great. He, but he, he played, and a dear friend of mine back in, in the East Coast, Joe Carbone, yeah. became a dear friend of Joe Pass, and Joe Carbone, a fantastic guitar player in his own right. They were dear friends, and when they'd get together, they'd play together and do different dates yeah, together yeah. in the East Coast. So when I had a chance to, to meet Joe Pass at that time in the early days, Joe Pass would play, he played, the, you'd hear the bass line, yeah. You hear the comping changes and then the melody. Yeah, well, he played on the changes as well as anybody. Him and Stan Getz, Paul Desmond, those guys. Yeah. Stan Getz, one of the great tenor players. Yeah. And uh, I played with him a couple of times. A thrill. But, uh, uh, Joe Pass was, was a genius. Him and, uh, him and Wes Montgomery, to me, were yeah. the two yeah. greatest yeah. jazz guitar players. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of great young players now, you know. But uh, they all learn from Joe and, and Wes Montgomery. And, and, and that's where the, the, the lineage of what this is about, yeah. to go back and listen to those great players. Yeah, yeah. You know, Django. These, these, these for, are, for Django, it was a great album, man. It really yeah. is. I mean, Joe yeah. plays so good on it. Yeah. Uh, and he could play fast. End of each set, when we, played, we went to Japan a few times and, uh, you know, some places in the States. And he would always play like da 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 last tune, you know, the set. <laughs> Drum solo, you know. <laughs> but I got so used to playing a tempo, I could do it, but I couldn't do that now. You gotta do that all the time, those fast tempos. Absolutely. To be able to, you know, I, I practice at home, I, I put a track on with that thing, I can't keep up with it, you know. <laughs> but I don't have to, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> What was it and when, I know you put a couple dates with Miles. How did that yeah. come about? What was that about? Well, uh, Miles was forming this new group well, he got Herbie Hancock, but he wanted Victor Feldman. He was courting Victor. He would come in the club where we were working every night for like two weeks, 
courting victory, you know. Yeah. The victory didn't want to go on the road. I mean, uh, so uh, Miles was going to open this club called the It Club in deep LA. And uh, people were there. The, Tony had just turned 16. They said, this boy is too young to play in this den of iniquity, whatever they said. Right. So uh, I had no drummer. So Miles had heard me. So he thought, oh, I'll call this guy. He's coming to fill in until Tony's. <laughs> so I got this phone call. and. Uh, as an agent, Ben Shapiro, God, I don't even remember his name. He said, are you working tonight? I said, no. He says, we'd like to play with Miles Davis. I'm like, jeez. <laughs> 1963, Miles was it, you know? Oh, yes. And, uh, he was it until oh, he died. Boy. And, to, and so, to this day, still it. <laughs> I said, I, I told him, I said, I'd be too nervous. I, I can't do it. You know, so I hung up. My wife said, you idiot. I said, you'll regret that for the rest of your life. Call back. So I tried to call back, Ben. And then this operator came on saying, an emergency call for Colin Bailey. It was Miles, he said. What's his nervous? Just get your ass down here. <laughs> oh, but, man. So you, but you heard that Miles oh, voice yeah. on the phone. There, there was some things that uh, I didn't remember driving there. So I walk in the club with my cymbal bag up on the stage. <clears throat> some guy said, hey, man, that ain't Tony Williams. Made me feel real good, you know. <laughs> <laughs> when Tony came in, I did two nights on a, on a set the third night, and he came in, and boy, awesome. Just it up. awesome. Everybody was copying his stuff. Yeah. Copying his stuff you know. Oh, it's to this day still. Yeah. So, what, so you get to the gig, you bring your cymbals in, and what was the conversation with Miles? What, what, what did you play? What? Well, he, they were very kind. They had done this album, you know, uh, that uh, Herbie Hancock was on. Herbie Hancock, Ron Carter, and George Coleman. And um, they didn't play any of those tunes. So maybe Colonel, they played If I Were a Bell, stuff I've been listening to on Miles Records for years right. from the 50s. So they were really, really good, you know. And you played two nights? Yeah, and, and a set. And the, the, your, your solos <coughs> you played that Miles let you, Miles let you yeah. open up? And yeah, I did. I did some like eights, fours, and I told you, Miles, I'll, I'll keep, keep the language get it clean. But Miles always got off the stand when he'd soloed. He went off somewhere, but he went out. He came back and at the end of the set and he came up on the stand. He said to me, I was outside, man. And he said, I was listening. He says, all I got in was your left hand. He <laughs> said, ride symbol, man, ride symbol. You know, I said, hey, you know, I went right in there. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a, a, like an on-the-job on training lesson. Oh, what, yeah, yeah. Well, it's an honor, man. Jeez, I play with Miles. Yeah. But uh, my most biggest thrill we were talking about earlier was that when I did this session with Frank Sinatra and Antonio Carlos Jobim. Sinatra and Jobim, yeah, what was that oh, like? No, it was it? Frank came over and shook hands. I went, here's me from Stratton St. Margaret shaking hands with Frank Sinatra. You know, it was really, mm, but uh, it was a beautiful day. I did four tracks. I could have done the whole album, but I was with George Shearing at the time. And we happened to be in LA at Shelley's Manor for two weeks. And Monday night, the first session was on a Monday night, it was our night off. So they let me do it. You know, usually I like to have the same guy, but right. George Gilberto had recommended me to Jobim. And uh, Jobim says, any drummers you, you know, can do Brazilian stuff, so he said me. But that was beautiful. That, I was on the four best tracks on the album. Not the, Frank, it was American tunes. He sang them better than the Brazilian tunes. Hmm. It was unbelievable. I mean, Jobim himself is oh, just, this, the, the, what he has written, his legacy of writing is it, brilliant music. He, he was more than a genius, man. Yeah. He, he wrote hundreds of great tunes. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's tunes that people don't know even. I, you, know, you hear like something on YouTube or something. Boy, I mean, just. How amazing, how amazing. And, uh, now Sinatra, I mean, to be in the presence of Sinatra oh, and to record awesome. with Sinatra, awesome. it doesn't get any deeper than that yeah, as was, far yeah. as. I looked over, and he's in like a, what they used to call a baffle, and there's a window in there. I looked over and he's got his hat on. I'm looking, I'm thinking, Jesus, you know, I'm playing for Sinatra. This is insane, you know. But uh, yeah, it was great. And the music was all Brazilian music? Well, it was, uh, I concentrated on you, changed partners, Bobos, Bangles and Bees, and Gingy was the only Brazilian tune. Right. The others were like American standards. Interesting. But great arrangers, like Klaus Ogerman, yes. who just passed away. Man, he was an incredible writer, you know. Yeah. I think he had like four, four flutes and some cellos and, and the rhythm section. So you had, you've had the experience of playing small group to this kind of orchestration yeah. What an amazing vast. Who were, who were your favorite drummers that you listened to? Oh, when I was really young, yeah. my first uh, first knock was uh, Joe Daniels and the Hot Shots. I was a London band. It was probably terrible, but I thought, I thought it was great. And then I heard Gene Krupa, you know, then Buddy. 
And then uh, Shelley, 1949, he just blew me away. Yeah, David Shelley Turf, and all those guys. I mean, I'm a fan of drummers. Man. Yeah. Uh, Sonny Igo. And where did Morello fit in? I, I heard Joe on a record. Uh, I was on the road in England, 1960, or <laughs> 1958. And he had done a record with Brubeck called Tour of American Cities. And Joe did this thing, Sounds of the Loop. Right. Chicago. The solo on there was so incredible and insane. I thought, how can anybody do it? It was stuff with the left hand. I mean, God. Yeah. I saw some trick recording, but they weren't doing that in those days. Absolutely. Yeah, and when I was living in Australia, Joe came over with Dave Brubeck. And I was in the group opening again for them, you know, so I got to hang out with Joe. I, 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 I that's, that's the first time you met him in yeah, Australia. Yeah, I didn't leave him for a minute, man, when he was showing me the finger control. <laughs> he was great, though. He didn't say, hey, he was like, that's enough, you know. But you learn that stuff. You, you know, I know when, when I studied with Joe for, for the many years I was there, every lesson was magic because it was very different, and he knew brilliantly how to build on what you were doing. Yeah, so yeah. he'd give you the next exercise. We worked, of course, deeply out of stick control. Yes, yeah, he said the first, the first page, the first line. First 13. He said, if you can get through that, yeah. Accurately, not even fast, accurately, you're doing good. Yeah, yeah. Was, <laughs> I'm yet to do that. <laughs> I hate to say. How humble you are, for sure. Oh, really. It's amazing because Joe you know, took us through the book, and then when he, he gave us notes that he had yeah. that eventually turned out to his two books, Master Studies 1 yeah. oh, Master and Master Studies, Studies 2. I get that out when I'm feeling masochistic. <laughs> yeah, that stuff. Beautiful stuff that, that oh. he wrote. And I remember in the lesson with Joe, Joe would bring up your name, and Joe yeah, would say, you yeah. know, and when I, of course, when I mentioned I was going out to California, to LA, he said, you have to look up Colin. Yeah. So I then began to research you and your playing and oh. buying the albums and getting <laughs> the stuff, and, and, I, and, I, and I studied you, and I started to hear a whole unique style in your sound than Morello's sound, but I could still hear influences of... Oh, Joe was a big influence on me. You could hear the influence, but you really had your own sound. Oh, yeah, yeah. Which was fantastic to yeah. experience, because I said, this is how it works. Colin is Colin, but I can hear that influence of Joe oh, yeah, in there. Joe, yeah. If I can capture some of that, so I ended up stealing from Joe, and then stealing from you too. Oh, yeah, God. So I took from the best. So when you're still working. <laughs> my influences, main influences in my playing with Jimmy Cobb, when I heard Jimmy play on Kind of Blue. Man, kind that, of Blue. Dang, dang, that's, that's how I play now. You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he's a dear friend of mine. You know? It's, it's an that, honor to know him. Yeah, <laughs> Jimmy, but Jimmy is... Still. Yeah, 86, I think, and he's still on the road. Actively playing on the road and yeah. playing, and you know that right symbol feel when he plays? Oh, boy, that's it. It's still there. That's, that's still what there. killed me. I, I, I said, I have to do this. I have to play like that, you know, so. So Jimmy Cobb, who else? Jimmy yeah, Cobb? Mel Lewis was a big influence on me. How great. Mel got me into Flam. Blah, 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 you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. He's my favorite big band drummer. I mean, Buddy is insane, but Mel Lewis, you know, for his style of big band boy, that's. That Thad Jones, Mel Lewis, oh, big band. I, I used to go to the I, Vanguard. I heard, I heard them at the Vanguard. Yes. Uh, 1974. I was back playing. Uh, remember the Playboy hotels they had when in, uh, yes. in New Jersey, when in Wisconsin? I played with Victor Moon, the singer, you know, Monty Budwig, I mean, and uh, oh, Pepper Adams and all those great players. Man. Vanguard. Yeah. What, but that, that, it, it's still a hub yeah, yeah. for great, great music. In the yeah, well, I played there twice with Richie Cole. When, at that time when you saved me. And <laughs> I remember you came to New York to play with Richie Cole and uh, you needed some drums. So I got you some drums. You needed a yeah. ride to oh, get there. God. So I, I got a ride to you there. I came to pick you, you up after the show. You picked me up every night after they got two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I got God, you back. Talk about friendship. <laughs> well, oh. and, you know, it, 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 it was friendship because of the incredible respect that I have for you oh, as a person, as a player, Colin. You. You, you have influenced so many people, and you've influenced people that you probably don't know of. When I spoke to Steve Smith, both Steve and I were going through bass room control for double bass, oh, yeah, yeah. you know, way before you even yeah, thought it was a double bass book. Thank God it's adaptable. It, most it, of the it, people it, that buy it now are double pedal. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. And, and, and so your book kind of stepped into our culture of learning, yeah, yeah. and it was a very important part of it. Yeah. And not only the, the jazz solos, but um, bass room control solos. Yeah, the bass room control that's a hard book. It's a hard book, but again, when you, when you have the, the desire to start to go through a book like that, yeah. what you reap out of that is so unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Bass room control solos was a pain in the neck for me. You know how I recorded that was, uh, I took a tape machine up into my drum room, and I did a lot of stuff, a lot of fours, and I picked out the stuff that I liked, you know? Yeah. So that's how that book came about. And then I had to go in the, in the studio and record it. <laughs> I was practicing my own stuff, you know? It was like, 
I was going to give it up, and my wife said, "Yeah, I mean, you put so much time in." It. So, uh, it's it's a good book, man. But People the recording want... is fantastic, and to have the recording in the early days, we didn't have that recording. To have yeah. it now has helped not only myself but my students. So it's yeah. amazing that you went through that effort. Yeah. Well, I'm very proud of the CD that's on that book. Yeah, you know, uh, Bruce Foreman and Scott Steed, and boy, we just I played some good solos. On <laughs> boy, that was that was good. That that's was, a, that was man, a few years ago now. That's yeah. amazing to experience. Now, you know, Colin, you, you've had, had, had this incredible career. You're still playing, yeah. probably better than ever now. I feel like I am, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's amazing, right? I finally learned how to play at yeah. 80, 82 <laughs> years old. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the, the people that watch this in future generations, as, the, as they, they, they look at this here and they go back to the names that you have, and again, what I always request, the names that you've mentioned, you know, Victor Feldman and Barney Kessel and all this, Joe Pass, for them to go and research these names. Yeah, yeah. And it's easy for them to research because they can go there, they can Google it, pull it up, pull up some of the albums that they have, listen to the music, and kind of go back. We were doing that on the phone here a while back. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> From their phone they can do it, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So I, I say those names that you've mentioned, for them to go do the research. You did a lot of teaching in your life, and you've had students that have come to you and work with you, and, and, and what would you say, if, if, if we had to close this, what would you say to the next generation that, you know, that what, how, what you learned in your life, what could you pass on to them? Well, do lots of listening to people. Listen to drummers, different, so whatever style you're looking for. There's so many great jazz drummers to listen to, and you know, rock people, Jesus. Yeah. Some fantastic drummers. And uh, do a lot of listening, you know, and a lot of practicing. But so, if you, the experience is playing with, with a group, a band, whatever. That's the best experience. And then, the biggest test of all is when you hear yourself back on the recording. <laughs> it doesn't lie, right? <laughs> oh boy, that's the truth. Yeah. I've, I've, a couple of albums I was on that I thought, oh man, you know, I wish they wouldn't put this one out. Just one <laughs> track, you know, but uh, I won't <laughs> give, give my secret away. But. <laughs> so listening, practicing, yeah. playing out with playing, live musicians. Playing is the, the, the best, best thing. Practicing and play, all three of that, listening. We'll do a lot of listening. I, yeah. I listen to records all the time, you know. When yeah. I, was, you know I don't listen so much now, but, uh, uh, but I still just listen to records all the time. I listen to those guys play, you know. Yeah. So many good drummers, uh, jazz drummers. Well, th th there's many good, you know, you talked about. When Max you were, Roach. Ma Max Roach, there's a well, name. Well, Max was a big influence. You know, I stole a thing from him, which I still play to this day. Paradiddle. He did it like I went, wow. He just blew me away. And I was like 1949, 1950 when I first heard him play with, with Clifford Brown. Clifford Brown. What a beautiful oh, person Max was, too. Good, bad yeah. Max. Well, jazz, jazz is an American born music. Yeah. It's probably America's greatest export. It's amazing how it's shifted. So we hope that even by these interviews, that this young generation can understand that even if they want to play rock or funk or pop or metal, whatever their style is, if you go back to jazz and listen yeah. to jazz and listen to what, what it offers, and when I hear people talk about John Bonham, and John Bonham from the band Led Zeppelin. Yeah, see, I've never heard any of that stuff. Well, he was a great, 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 literally a great, great rock drummer. Yeah, yeah. But his two greatest influences were Buddy Rich and Joe Morello. Yeah, yeah. So I always say if you want to understand John Bonham, you got to go back and listen to Morello and Buddy. Yeah, yeah. And when you do that, it opens up your mind for yeah, the process. Yeah, that's so, great. So that's I think great. With, with these names that you have, when you research all these great, great names, yeah. I think that's what the young generation is, you know, can hopefully feel from yeah, this. Yeah, well, I hope they listen to jazz because you know, the problem with jazz is like people aren't used to harmonic music anymore. Yeah. Used to those, like those basic triad chords in rock music. Right. When you go to like flat five and raise, it's like over their heads. Yeah. They can't get it, you know? Yeah. Uh, I've tried playing jazz for, <laughs> there's a young lady, <clears throat> when Jen passed away, my late wife, she, uh, she had all this bank stuff, so the bank manager was a friend, came over and helped me with all this stuff, you know. I tried playing her jazz, you know, to influence her. <laughs> Didn't get too far. Didn't get too far, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully this next generation will understand that well, I hope so. jazz is a very important part it is. of understanding music, no matter what style you want. Yeah. You know, t t technically, I mean, there's, there's a lot, lot to, to do with technique. Yeah. I yeah. mean, to make it tasteful, you know. Yeah. yeah. I, I use the bass drum all the time. Like, oh, solo, yeah. All the time. Everything I ever do has got the bass drum. I do bass drum and cymbal, you know, that kind of stuff. You know. yeah. uh, the bass drum is 
I mean, I, I use it all the time. Well, you really brought the bishop to a, a level of as you know, it, you you made it its own little instrument, <laughs> yeah. and then you gave us the book and the exercises to practice yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And now, where we are today, it's a major force. That yeah, bass yeah. drum concept yeah. and technique is a major force in today's music. Colin, it's amazing to have the time with you here to sit down and That's just wonderful talk to you, my dear friend. Absolutely. On behalf of the sessions, we thank you so much. I love you so much, man. Yeah, likewise, Stay well, man. keep likewise. on drumming, and I want to come by and hear you real soon. Okay, Dom. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you.